so much, Candice, and thank you all for coming out this morning. I feel the entrepreneurial mojo in this room. It takes a lot to get out at 9 a.m. on a Wednesday with all the busy lives that everyone in this room has. It's always helpful for me to know who's in the room, and I'm curious, how many people are either future or current entrepreneurs? Could you raise your hands? Oh, wow. That's why I feel the mojo. And um, how many are investors? Maybe you don't want to raise your hand because you're just... <laughs> how, how many are students? Great. Well, you're ahead of the pack, I think. This is what I have four children myself, and I always tell them that entrepreneurship is a life skill that everybody really needs. You might not use it at every stage of life, but it's a really good thing to have in your bag of tricks because the world of work is changing so much. As Candace said, I'm a journalist. I've been at it for many years. I was a senior editor at Fortune Small Business Magazine for eight years. And then I went solo myself and started a business in 2015 as a freelance writer. Now, like a lot of you, my business has morphed in the direction that the economy is going. So I started in on content marketing. I started ghostwriting books. Um, and ghostwriting articles for people. Um, then I got into um, consulting and other things. So that's kind of where I am now. So I'm living the life. I've been doing it for 15 years, living in New Jersey. Uh, Candace is a fellow former New Jerseyite. We were complaining about the cost of living in New Jersey. Somehow managed to do it all these years. And But I know it's a struggle and it's hard to do this. And you're kind of swimming against the tides sometimes of society. and all the way things are set up. Um, so I'm glad we came together to share this information. I think events like this are so important because there's not really one place you can go and find this stuff out. And I've been very lucky that in my books, The Million Dollar One Person Business, and more recently, Tiny Business, Big Money, the entrepreneurs that are getting to seven figures are sharing what they do. There's not that many of them, and they're surprisingly generous. When, as a journalist, when I we do stuff for Fortune, if you're interviewing corporate leaders, they never want to tell you their secret sauce and what's working for them because they're so competitive. But these people are very community-minded and they've shared a lot. So I'm lucky to be the conduit to you in, in finding out what they're doing. And um, what I found out, the reason I got on this whole track of a million dollar one person business was I do a blog for Forbes five times a month and I write about entrepreneurship, and I started writing more and more about solo entrepreneurship. One, one thing I found was, when I was an editor, a lot of times the startups got all the love, and everybody wanted to know, you know what is going to be the next Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or whatever it is, and no one really cared about the one-person businesses, and yet when you looked at it, they made up the majority of all businesses, and the questions that I got from people were really about the one-person business. People would be like, okay, great about that startup, but you know, I want to quit my job, and I want to start a business, but I need to make a living. That was always the question. So I started getting into this, and I'm kind of a last-minute person when it comes to writing. I don't know about you, um, but I got to the second to last day of the month with my Forbes blogs, and I was running out of inspiration for the last blog, and I started digging around on Google. I love data, and I was looking at census statistics, and I came across statistics on the non-employer business. Now, the name non-employer tells you a lot. You can call someone a non-something. <laughs> that, that shows you how the government looked at it. But they still were keeping records, and what I noticed was that more of them were getting to one million in revenue, like the one to 2.5 million category was the biggest, but there were some that were over 2.5, and a small elite group of like 337 were getting to 5 million and up. And after that, they just took them out and said, there must be a mistake. We, you know, they, they're classifying themselves as non-employers, but they should really be employers, which I want to get to the bottom of, but I haven't yet. Um, and the numbers started going up. Um, but at that time, I wrote this blog post just about the data, and people started writing to me. It was the BlackBerry, I was still in the BlackBerry era, and so I had my BlackBerry on the table in my dining room, and it looked like it was about to jump off the table, so people were all writing to me to try to find out more. They're like, Elaine, this is a cliffhanger. You didn't tell us who the businesses are. What are they doing? You just gave us categories. This tells us nothing. So I said, okay, 
I can't get this from the Census Bureau because if you ever fill out the census forms for your business, they don't give your information out to just anybody off the street or even any journalist. So I had to write to the readers of Forbes and I said, if you're one of these businesses, please write to me. And it was a very slow process. Over about a year, I heard from five. And one of them is Alan Walton. He ran a, an online spy camera store. He, his mom made him get a job at the mall at the spy camera store, but he was <laughs> doing nothing over the summer. And he learned a lot about it. So it was him, um, Rachel Charlubsky, who runs this babysitting service at um, sporting events. Uh, there was somebody who did a, um, his name's Peter Leeds. He had a financial services newsletter. He was a financial planner. Dan Bezeritsky, he's a fitness trainer who is licensing out his fitness methods to other fitness trainers. Um, there was a fifth one, I'm forgetting who it was. But that one went crazy viral. It was like 335,000 page views almost overnight. People, you know, same thing, big response. So I saw that there was a lot of hunger for this information. And so I started writing about this. This was about 2012. And I built up a body of these profiles and eventually an agent contacted me. And over the years that I was writing about it, I, around that, a little bit before that time, there were about 29,000 of these entrepreneurs. Now it's 43,000, so every year it increased. And these numbers are very small when you figure this, I think about 32,000 small businesses in the US, so these are like less than 1%. But the numbers are growing, and I feel like the more people know about what they're doing, the more the numbers will grow. There's just not really many people teaching this. There are individual entrepreneurs with their courses and things like that and master classes, but it's hard for the average person to gather the info. So I've taken that role upon myself to keep interviewing them and try to find out what they're doing right. Um, one interesting trend in the economy that I noticed, I just saw this thing, all these Redditors write to me all the time and they were circulating this chart. Businesses are just getting more efficient because we have so many tools, digital, technological tools. This chart, it looks to me like it only takes two employees to generate one million in revenue in an S&P company. So even the big companies are getting more efficient. We probably feel that when we go to a business and you're waiting in a really long line because there are two people at the counter and they're going as fast as they can. It's not necessarily always a good trend, but with these one-person businesses, you, they don't usually take on as much as an S&P company would take on, and they tailor the business to what their capacity is. But it is, I think it's an important trend. And I think we hear a lot about, you know, robots are gonna come and take our jobs, and we should try to stop this. I know it's a controversial point, but my feeling is that it's kind of like, uh, I'm not a motorcycle rider, but I can talk to them, and this is principle of leading into the turn rather than trying to um, fight it. And I, I feel like this is the way the world is going. We have such great technologies, and if we try to put the genie back in the bottle, it's not going to work. It's just out all over the world. So how do we make this work for ourselves so that everybody can make a good living and live where they want and not be struggling? I mean, there is a lot in the gig economy where there are people struggling, and there's a lot of work to be done on that in terms of things like healthcare and things being affordable in terms of housing depending on the market and other things. But I feel like empowering people with these tools to create businesses for themselves is one way for some people to address it. Not everybody is entrepreneurial, and most of you are, so you have that gift, but I also have to acknowledge that there are people that just love being part of a big corporate team. That's who they are, and we need that too. And we need a whole ecosystem of all the businesses, because who are going to be the B2B customers if we're all one-person businesses, even if we're million-dollar one-person businesses? So there's um, six categories that I, I covered in looking at um, the data. And these guys are some new ones that I found. Actually, this year, they went on Shark Tank. They're two boys from college who, young men from college, who, um, they like to take naps, and they want they couldn't find a good place to nap, so they started covering these dog beds that they saw around. The dog beds were too small for them, so they they started ordering these different foam mattresses and things. And they came, I wrote about them for Forbes, and they came up with this invention, um, and they became a million dollar one person business. They went on oops, they went on Shark Tank with that, and. Um, 
they've done quite well. I have no doubt they'll go beyond one million because they got to one million in about a year. And you know, they had a lot of interesting experiments with pricing and things like that. I think it goes for that $400. Great novelty gift, I guess, if you have someone who's a napper in your life. But it just shows you how sometimes you, you don't have to necessarily reinvent the wheel. You just maybe need a new spin on something that's already being done. And they did this from um, Noah's parents' basement. Yuki found me on Instagram and wrote to me. This is a good way to reach journalists, by the way, um, those messages, because we get a lot of messages in our email inbox. And I love their story. It was so great. And they're also marketing it to pet influencers. I'm not sure exactly why. I think maybe like the Great Danes. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> so, so there are six categories that I found. So if you look at the data yourself, you'll see there are other ones. I picked the categories that I think are best for the average energetic person. The, the ones that get to five million are generally hedge funds and actors and actresses that are like a one-person LLC. So I don't promote that area as much because most people don't have that skill set. If you do, that's a good way to go. But for, for the average person with some work experience, e-commerce, manufacturing, informational content creation, that's the people that are doing like masterminds, courses, etc. There's a lot of new variations on the theme. I know uh, Candice and Bill have a um, a course out on LinkedIn that they're doing. There's a lot of people doing interesting things like that to productize their knowledge. They, uh, one example of this that I came across that was very powerful and made, and made the point for me, I had a, uh, for creditcards.com, I was writing an article about a really obscure change in credit card law, and there were these two lawyers in Washington, D.C. who were like the world's leading experts on this topic. I had to pay $270 or something to attend their webinar to write the story. So I get on the webinar, there's 600 people on it, all paying that, and then they're re-airing it, the recording for the same price on another day. And I thought, those lawyers could never have met with all those people. They just could never have gotten caught up. And here in a couple of hours plus whatever, maybe 15 hours prep time and whatever, they paid the, info, uh, the um, webinar company Look what they did. And they had a really boring area of knowledge, but it was very useful. So a lot of times people think, oh, I'm not Gary Vee, I can't do a course, you know. But there are people with professional knowledge that are making it very palatable and snackable for people that need to have that information and maybe can't meet with them in person or can't afford to. Maybe it would cost $600 an hour to sit down with them for two hours, so $300 is a bargain for you. There, it's, there's no limit to this type of idea. Um, so I would encourage you all, if you leave this room with one idea, think about that. What informational product could you create out of what you already know? It could be in your personal life, too. It could be something like yoga for non-limber people or something like that. Um, okay, so professional services and creative businesses. People always say don't trade time for dollars, but guess what? The biggest category a million dollar one person businesses with 10,000 of the 40 something thousand is professional services. So it's kind of counterintuitive and interesting. They're just very efficient. All these businesses are what some people would call capital efficient businesses. Basically, they start with no money. They live on the owner's money you know, that they extract from their savings and their job. Most of these don't have any kind of outside funding. So they're very ingenious about maximizing every resource, maximizing their relationships, bartering, using technology so that they don't have to hire a person until a little bit later. And we'll get into that. I'm not against hiring, which is what I talk about, tidy business. Um, then there's personal services, people like um, nutritionists, personal trainers. Like I wrote about one woman for Forbes, Megan Kelpner, um, about two days ago. She um, had Crohn's disease and she uh, had to quit her advertising career. She went back to school, became a nutritionist, healed herself, and then she started using her website to teach other people how to do the same thing. And she's very feisty and is always writing these posts against Nutella and things like that. You know, that create a lot of, of discussion online. And she has a, a, a cooking school, an online cooking school now. She's created a community. She's at about two million. She's got a small child, and you know, she's got a very balanced life. 
Um, and then real estate, real estate rental and leasing, thank you to Airbnb. Um, that's a really hot category, these super hosts. They're making money. I have somebody in tiny business, big money. He's about 27 years old, and he rents high-end villas in Florida. He's a million-dollar business. He had to hire employees eventually. He borrowed some money from his dad to get started, paid it back, and the first Airbnb. That's another thing you could do. If you, a lot of people that are starting or running businesses have to have a day job. That's a, one of those Silicon Valley ideas that like you've got to be all in or you're not a real entrepreneur. The reality is everybody doesn't have that kind of funding. So how are you going to pay for your rent or your mortgage unless you have a job or you have someone in your life who's paying for it? Um, so real estate is a good one if you're trying to juggle things. And you can also, there's a new trend where people are renting out other people's Airbnbs and sort of managing like property management. So you don't even need to be able to get a mortgage, which is difficult right now in this high interest environment. Um, okay, so what do these businesses have in common? I have to say, they all seem to love Tim Ferriss. <laughs> Four hour work week. It's, I, I was on the Tim Ferriss show a couple of times and um, he really is the patron saint of these businesses because he's such a student of efficiency. Not everybody is part of the digital nomad culture. I think that's for people that are encumbered to a local school district and things like that. Um, but, but he really popularized a couple of ideas. Outsourcing, um, meaning you don't do all the work of the business yourself. If you say you're, you're doing an Amazon store, you're using um, Fulfilled by Amazon, so you're not packing up pallets of goods on your driveway. Um, automation, it could be simple things like using a scheduling app, like Calendly. For me, that saves me at least four hours of time every week, and I always encourage everyone in these tiny and one-person businesses, try to save one hour a week through automation. Throw down the gauntlet to yourself to figure out a few tools that you can use, because they're designing them for the average person. Some people feel like, oh, I'm not a techie, I hate the setup, but if you commit over the course of a year to just learn three or four of these that will save you time, imagine getting back one day a week. What a gift that is. Even if you don't use it on work, you just use it to replenish the well. It's, it's a powerful gift for any entrepreneur. Um, and then hiring contractors, I'll get into my survey later, but basically nobody exists in a vacuum. I have um, a, a guy from Morocco named Azadine who writes to me a lot on LinkedIn, Cat Candace's favorite, and, and he's always asked me, is, is starting a one-person business selfish? And nothing, I feel like no, supporting yourself is not selfish. Supporting yourself is contributing to society, and they don't exist in a vacuum. They all are interdependent with other businesses in the ecosystem. So if I create work for a vendor who does my social media, versus creating a job for an admin. Is one better than the other? I'll leave that to you to decide. It's a controversial point, but I feel like they're all creating work in the economy. They're all circulating revenue into the economy. They're all supporting other people. And they give back a lot through their businesses. These businesses are personal. These are people who care. They know their customers. And I feel like there's something really important about that, when you can know the real person as opposed to a bot. There's some gift that comes in that, um, you know, any, anyone can be in a vacuum and be selfish, but I really don't find that they are. In fact, a lot of them know each other, independent of me, they just seem to get around and meet each other all over the place. Um, so who is creating the businesses? This is Rachel Charlupsky from that original article. If she was managing something like 2,000 babysitters on her Blackberry, and she, and she never revealed to me how she did that, but she was a college student in Arizona, and she was working at a hotel offering childcare on site for vacationers. And then she realized, well, you know, what if people, um, sports teams come and play at a stadium? They, maybe the spouses would like to watch the game and not bring the children in. So she started this high-end babysitting service and it really caught on. And she started opening up locations in different places around the country. And they're all contractors. She pays them very well, I think the minimum she charges like $35 an hour for babysitting, which if you have kids, you know that's pretty expensive. Um, 
very high quality, everybody goes through all kinds of testing, drug testing, things like that, so parents have a lot of assurance that their $35 an hour is well spent. And um, she's been around for a long time. She hired her brother for a while, and then she went back to being a one-person business because he moved on to other things. So she's been pretty consistently a solo. And then John Johnson was interesting. He was somewhat from the recession, the last recession, he created these B2B e-commerce sites. One is called ppekits.com. And this was before the um, pandemic. He was selling these protective kits with masks and things like that. Um, and he also does direct gov source where he'll sell things like police bicycles to police departments. And he worked in real estate and he knew his company was going to go out of business in the last recession. And he was in midlife and he was worried about getting another job. And he started this from his home, and he's doing really great. He's at, the last time I talked to him, $4 million in revenue. Uh, he, sometimes his sons help him out in the business, but they're basically teenagers um, doing fantastic. And he's another consistent performer. Um, Corey Bisfield, he's in the real estate rental and leasing. He was a financial planner working in San Francisco, and he hated all the traffic, so he wanted to move back to Duluth, Minnesota, where he's from, and he needed a way to do that. He wasn't really making that much as a financial planner, so he, um, one of his clients was um, an investor in real estate. He was a farmer also, and the, the farmer convinced him that he should invest in real estate, so, but he, he couldn't qualify for mortgage. He was on the younger side then. And he convinced the seller of the real estate to basically give him a mortgage. Then he, he lived in one apartment. It was a duplex, and he rented the other. And then he used that money to start getting other properties, and he was able to get a mortgage. And now he has over 100 of these duplexes. And he does it all in, in a college town. That's kind of his thing. And now he trains people also on how to do this themselves. He's um, been doing this for a long time. One thing you'll notice, they're not generally, other than the pluffle, I hope I pronounced that right, they, they're generally not one-year successes. The one-year successes are usually on e-commerce because you can, if you get on Amazon or somewhere like that, or you get onto, kids, um, onto um, no, no, um, no, the contest one, um, yeah, Shark Tank, sorry, Shark Tank, like you'll, you'll go a lot faster. Um, <clears throat> Tiffany Williams, she's interesting too. She had no access to capital when she started. She was working for Living Social. She knew she was going to get downsized. And she started a business where um, she was selling, she liked Yorkshire Terriers. She went on Teespring. She had an artist she found on one of the freelancing platforms design this cute t-shirt. She created a community on Facebook for Yorkie lovers, started selling the t-shirts there, and use the money from that to do what she really wanted to do, which was create a community for women who wanted to start a business on Facebook. And she's grown this. Um, she actually had ovarian cancer in the middle of growing it and recovered. She's really remarkable. Um, and she has an extended team of contractors, including her mother. Um, and she's growing it like gangbusters. She was having in-person events, then it kind of closed down a little during the pandemic. Now she's getting back into this. and. Um, She's a powerhouse. If you ever can go to her event, she is so great at sharing all the hacks, you know, the different um, technological tools that she uses, low-cost things. And I have a list of some of them that she shared with me, a tiny business, big money, but there's more. She's really a genius at that. Um, one, uh, one thing that I noticed about this trend is it's open to every demographic. I just, I, I hack the numbers because when you look at things like middle market firms or startups, they tend to not be very diverse. But this trend is really open to every demographic in America. And I haven't really seen the government slice and dice it, but I was able to pull something that the only group I didn't find in this set of data was people with disabilities. But people with disabilities are very well represented among the one-person business community because they need flexibility. And they excel in, in this type of business. They um, like e-commerce. There's really no, you know, unless it's a visual disability. But there are a lot of adaptive technologies now, so that people can set themselves up. Um, one of the interesting things I found. I'm already almost running out of time. I got to go a little faster. Is 
these businesses tend to follow a certain trajectory. When, when I updated the million dollar one person business, it came out in 2018, I updated it in 2021, and some of them had grown and they were apologizing to me for hiring employees. And I said, no, that is awesome. I worked with Vern Harnish on the book Scaling Up. I'm all for scaling up if that's the destiny for this business. I, I believe every business has a natural size and you will find it by running it and you really don't know in the beginning, like a family, right? You, I thought I was gonna have no kids, I have four kids. Go figure, right? You, you, you find you enjoy certain things about life and you'll double down on them. So they could save boutique size and commit to that. So you have people like Rachel Charlewski. They could turn into a traditional tech-enabled small business. And that's what that nutritionist Megan Telfner did. Now she has about seven employees. Um, you can evolve into a startup, which some of them do. They stay a one person or two partner business for like a year and then they scale up. And then you can get acquired too. A lot of the e-commerce firms are getting acquired and if you have one, there's a great list in a publication called Hanbeck, H-A-N-B-E-C-K, which lists companies like Thrasio that are acquiring e-commerce businesses and putting them into a stable. So you'll see these million dollar businesses, as long as they have about a 25% profit margin, they're getting acquired for about a million. So you're building not only a source of income, but a valuable property that you can sell and then reinvest in other things. So Megan is the tech-enabled small business, which you know a lot of her stuff is online, like the cooking school. Um, whoops. And then these are um, Coloradans, Lizzie and Matt. I met them at, the, at that picture I took in this bar that we met in in the morning in New York City, because it was the only place that was near their hotel. And they went up their pancake company, and they were like selling their pancake mix on the floor of Whole Foods themselves. They grew this. They, I think they raised like 50 million in venture capital. He was a math student, I think she studied chemistry, and they got married, they were very sweet um, as a couple, and they were very ambitious about growing the brand, and then they sold it to this one company, Sogos Brands, and now it got acquired by the company that owns Pillsbury. So that's another route where you can go the traditional scale-up route. It, it, it's all a matter of preferences. Some people don't want to be part of that whole venture capital world, because it's a lot of pressure. There are time frames that that can be hard, but some people do like it, and they, they were among them. Which leads us to the tiny business revolution. A lot of people get to that one million dollar, one person business mark, and they're really just running out of capacity, and they get to those crossroads, and they have to make some decisions. And hiring people, a lot of times, is the best decision because there are legal reasons why you have to do it. You can't misclassify people. Maybe you need people all the time, and having contractors doesn't work because they're juggling other clients. And what I found is this can be very lucrative too. Right? There's a smaller group of employer businesses of like 5.3 million, but I calculated for the whole country with the help of my two very math-oriented daughters using these really souped up census tables. The average revenue is 816,180 for the 5.3 million. And the payroll is 162,755. So that leaves them with over 600,000 left over for other things like paying the rent on the building, et cetera. Or maybe profit if it's virtual, if you're doing a lot with automation and maybe one employee. And for the five to nine employees, it gets even better. Um, the average revenue is 1.2 million. So if you're thinking about you want to get into the bigger numbers, that hiring the employees does let you expand your capacity. And now this is the crazy thing. When, I, when we figured out the chart, this is real, these are not the ones I'm recommending, by the way. When you subtract the average revenue, the average payroll from the average revenue, you get a very interesting look at America. And we did it for every business size in America. Basically, all the money in America is going to vices. So I'm not going to recommend. I don't want to pass judgment on casinos or other things. But that's the one. Um, creamery butter manufacturing, what's with that? I, I found this website, we are the Butter Institute. We control 90% of the Butter Institute in America. We have 27 proud companies, something like that. I'm like, okay, so they kind of got a corner on the market of this heavily automated business. It's heavily automated, that's why. Um, general medical and surgical hospitals, I, I believe these are the ones that if you have to get medical tests and the doctor has that little place where you go for the testing, these are smaller because they're under five employees. Mm -hmm. 
fossil fuel, electric power gener generation, down to the last five minutes. I don't know if I recommend that one. You like ten, zero? Oh, okay, five. Oh, ten. Okay. Um, and hospitals is the broader category. Now, I cure. Oh, see, this is the creamery butter. This is really crazy. Twenty-six million dollars in revenue. Less than five employees. Twenty-five point four million after making payroll. <laughs> This is a good business, right? <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Um, I have a chart at the back of the book with all these different businesses. It might give you, it has the NAICS code, so like my original article, I don't know exactly what the businesses are. I know what code they're under. The NAICS, I think it's North American Industry Classification System, something like that. Um, but then you can research it and look at market research reports online and get some ideas. I ruled out the ones that I thought people were going to have some objections to, and that's up to you to decide what you, you would build object to. But um, the highest opportunity ones, again, for the average person are these e commerce, high end personal and professional services. I say high end because things like um, Main Street businesses are the worst in terms of money left over after making payroll. They really are very marginal for the most part. But that could be because they're cash businesses and people are not reporting things. I don't know. Um, the high-end ones, like I had a um, Medi Spa in the new book. They do like Botox injections and things like that. Those do pretty well. Um, so it's more on the upper end of, of that um, niche. Manufacturing is really interesting. You can now be a one-person manufacturer from your living room using sites like Alibaba to outsource the manufacturing. Financial services is another one. There are people doing apps. Um, transportation. I have a woman in the book who is a um, seller of used private jets. She gets these huge commissions on these. Um, construction and real estate is kind of that category that involves rentals. Um, a Purva Bajra is a hybrid. He has a business that sells those bags inside of cereal boxes, but it's totally online. He's this young digital nomad from Texas used to be a Chevron engineer and makes $3 million a year. He was a solo. Now he started adding one or two employees, but he's incredible. He is kind of a manufacturer slash e-commerce slash wholesaler. So there's a lot of hybrid approaches to this too. And I did a survey of the businesses in the book, and this is what I found. It takes an average of four years to get to a million. I do not know why, and I, I surveyed 50 seven-figure entrepreneurs. So those of you who are academics know this is not a totally solid survey. This is just me trying to get a finger on the pulse. But I love, you know, kind of throwing down the gauntlet to the world to try to do this survey on a bigger scale. So if anyone knows of someone who would do it, I'd love to have this data. Um, the average business spent four years before hiring employees. And then there were 18% that never did hire employees. They have a team of recurring contractors and they just like it that way and probably never will hire an employee. But they do treat them really well. I know um, one entrepreneur in the second book, Jason Vandergren, he's from Toronto. He actually left his business. He's a single guy. He left a business in his will to hold his 40 contractors in Eastern Europe because a lot of them are impoverished and he buys health insurance for them in their countries. Even though he doesn't have to do it, he does do it. He flies out, has dinner with their families. A lot of them are very attached to the contractors, but they're very entrepreneurial and they like the idea of the contractors having their own business. It's just how they look at things. Um, and then 90%, 100% use contractors, 90% use some form of automation. So if there are going to be two things that you do to extend what your capacity is in your business, it's really looking into those two things. Um, there's a mind-body connection, and I think, I look at it like a food truck, right? If a food truck is in the shop, guess what happens? They can't sell the food. And it's the same thing with us as entrepreneurs. If we're sick or we overwork ourselves, we're, a lot of us are workaholic, then we get, you know, we can't work. So 88% exercise, yoga is the number one. I'm really glad to hear that because I do yoga. Um, but there's some other ones. 64% of a mind, body, or spiritual practice. Some of them it's meditation. Some of them said prayer. I thought that was interesting. 37% um, have a business coach or like a peer coach. It could be a friend who's in business. 45% belong to an entrepreneurship community. And I count these types of things as entrepreneurship communities because 
There's so much that happens when you're here bumping into people and talking. Okay, five minutes. Um, so your next steps, these are my takeaways just from interviewing maybe 40 of them in the first book and 50 in the second. A lot of the things we learn in business are about standardizing things and making the business sellable so that somebody else can step into it. That's all good to some extent, but the beauty of a one-person business is that a real person is running it, and the quirks are what we like about it, right? Like if you go into your favorite little bakery and the person who owns it is there and you talk to them, you like that. It's so much better than buying a baked good at Starbucks. No offense to Starbucks, but it's just the personality factor. Um, people love that and they're hungering for it because everything is so online right now. Um, skip the shoulds and do the work the way you want because they're reinventing businesses in real time. A lot of them have no meetings. Everybody has been told they need to have meetings. A lot of them are now just managing their team on things like Slack where they talk to them one on one. They hate meetings. Most of these people hate meetings. So why have them? We, uh, questioning the way things are done, the things that you hated in your corporate job it can pave the way to innovation and doing things more efficiently. Or things like, you know, everybody's got to be back in the office. There are hybrids. Megan has them come in once a month and they do macrame and things like that or they drink elixirs that she's cooked up. Why once a month? It's just what she thinks works for her team. She wants them to know each other, but she knows a lot of them are moms and it's hard for them to get in with small kids. Um, it's about passion. I think with these businesses, there are always businesses that you could start just to make money, but as you all laughed at the thing about the casinos, right? It's not very satisfying if it's not your life's passion. It can take experimenting to find what it is. Some of these people have tried five or six businesses that were nowhere near a million before they found the one. And just from talking to them so much, they feel it, they know it. It's like when they've hit it right, it just starts to take on a life of its own, and it's giving yourself the runway to do that, often by keeping a job for a while so that you have some money flowing in, and if you make a mistake, it doesn't put an end to the business. Um, and just staying open to the journey. I, I, I love million-dollar one-person businesses, but all of the businesses are necessary, and you may reach a point where you're like, I need an employee, and there's no shame in hiring an employee, but there's no shame in not hiring an employee. It's really what's right for you, because I believe all of these businesses contribute. Um, so here's how to contact me. This is my family. We love llamas and alpacas. We live in New Jersey, and um, I welcome you. I'm going to be here all day, and I write for Forbes and CNBC and other <coughs> publications, and I'm always looking for good entrepreneurship stories. You don't have to be at one million. Sometimes you can have an interesting story or you have an interesting area of knowledge, like I plan to interview Candace about LinkedIn. Things that would be of interest to entrepreneurs. I pretty much exclusively write about entrepreneurship, and I also write about meetings and events and a little bit about healthcare. Those are my areas. So hunt me down. I love hearing from people. Um, I love getting feedback on the books so I can become a better reporter, writer, etc. So please, if you read them, feel free. Um, and then, you know, on social media, I write back on those too. Sometimes that's the best way to reach me because my e email inbox is flooded with pitches. Um, so we have two minutes. Um, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> physical office is one, because that's next to payroll, that's usually the second biggest expense for many businesses. So depending on where you live, it could be the biggest. So if you can avoid that for as long as possible and do things virtually or do it in a co-working space. There, I know I'm from speaking with Candace, there are a lot of great co-working spaces around here. I think that's the number one thing. Don't go without health insurance. I've seen some of these folks on GoFundMe who skipped it. and. That's catastrophic in America. It's really a shame that it is, but you really need it, even if it's some sort of bare bones policy. Hopefully, they'll fix that at some point. Um, and then I think just isolating and overworking too much is another thing where they would work 24 7 and burn themselves out and not get enough sleep. 
you really need time for relationships in life, I think, including your family. I mean, some of them jeopardize their personal relationships by working too hard, and usually they course correct and realize what's the point of life if you have no personal relationships. Um, but a business can suck you in, especially if you are passionate about it, right? If work is play, it can be a little bit addictive, so you have to you have to have balance and moderation. That's what I learned from them, and and a lot of them do, and that's where the automation comes in, and that's where recognizing you need the contractors, and maybe you need to become a tiny business and have the employees. Thank you. Thank you. Did you have any conversations about profit? Because I know there's a lot of money dollars that are tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I have the profits for some of them, and the highest profit business in the book was 50%. Generally with the e-commerce, they're in the range of about 25%. The ones that were at break even or zero, I didn't include in the books, because I feel like they're, they're not there yet. They're not necessarily an example for other businesses. That said, a lot of them are in high-tax states, and people use a lot of tax minimization strategies in their business, like say their spouse helps them out with the bookkeeping, they put them on payroll, which then reduces the profit. So, you never really get the accurate sense of what someone's profits are. Even if you looked at their tax return, they're probably, if they were going to sell the business, a lot of times they restate things for the buyer to show what the profit really would be without you know, the company car put on the payroll. So that's always an open question is what any business's profits are. But yeah, I, I read them out. I always ask. I don't publish it because of that reason. but. Unless they were like, no, tell everybody, I'm really proud of it. And there's a couple in the books that didn't tell me. Um, but digital products, if you want profit, I know that um, if you can do digital products, once you do the creation and resell them, they, they really have almost no cost to market them once you get going. Um, but definitely a good, good question. Mm -hmm.